My name is James Harris. When all this happened, I was 52 years old. I was married to the woman I loved, I had two grown children whom we raised well, and a well-paid job that I liked. I had the world by the tail, and life was great, until it wasn't anymore. It all started on Tuesday evening. I worked late that evening, but not so late that my wife was worried and headed home after the rush hour traffic cleared. It was my usual Tuesday evening. We agreed that I would grab Chinese food on the way home, which I did. I parked in the garage, pressed the remote to lower the door, collected my briefcase and groceries, and headed inside. I was a mighty hunter returning to a cave to feed his hungry companion, or what passes for that in 21st century America. Almost immediately I noticed that my wife's car was not in its usual place, but I decided that she must have left on business at the last minute and assumed that she would be back soon. So I left the food set on the kitchen counter, hoping to keep it warm and knowing that if it was late, we would reheat it in the microwave. I walked down the hall to the front door, turned at the stairs and headed to our bedroom to change into something more comfortable. It was my usual everyday routine, come home, get comfortable and eat. Ten minutes later, I came down the stairs and called, Marie, are you home? Silence. I thought, where could she have gone? Maybe she left a note. I wasn't terribly alarmed, but by this time I was at least curious. I walked into the living room and found a note on the coffee table. It wasn't the note I expected, but it was one I never would have imagined. It read, Dear Jim, I'm sorry for doing this to you, but there is someone who needs me. Today they called me. This is one of those calls that you have to respond to when it comes. I'm sorry I ran away, without warning, and I know it will be hard for you, but please know that I love you more than life itself and will be back as soon as I can. I treasure the life we created together and hope to return to it when I can. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. Your loving wife, Mary. On the coffee table next to the letter was her cell phone. I was stunned and confused. I went over in my mind what I read in her mysterious letter. Did she say she needed someone? Who needs it? Who could be that important and not be worth telling me who it is? Then panic began. Where did she go? How could it be so urgent that she couldn't tell me where she would be? How could she leave her phone? When will she contact me? This was not the kind of note a wife leaves for her husband planning to return late that evening. Panic gave way to fear and fear to anger. How the hell could she do this? She just takes it and runs away without really explaining why or where she will be. Then darker thoughts crept into my mind, the first being, how could she forget her cell phone? Gave way to the second. Why did she leave her cell phone? I read her note again, and for the second time she told me no more than the first time. There is someone who needs me. Today they called me. This is one of those calls that you have to respond to when it comes. Who does she think she is? She is not a secret agent, not a super spy, not a neurosurgeon for the leaders of the fucking free world. Where is my wife? I admit that at that moment my anger was a mask for my fears. I was worried about my wife. Wherever she was, I was convinced that she would need my help. I wanted to go to her, but where did she go? I wanted to hear her voice and know that she was okay, but I have no way to contact her. I just sat and reread her note while dinner got cold and the sun set. When it got dark, I finally decided to start calling. Called her sister, our friends, and eventually called our kids. Nobody knew or told me anything. The worst thing is that I only managed to scare our children. I tried to convince them that nothing bad had happened, but I wasn't very good at it, so I hung up, promising that I would keep them informed. Now I was even more angry and blamed her for scaring our children although I myself was involved in this mistake. I reread it again, note, I cherish the life we created together and hope to return to it when I can. These are not the words of a person who will return home in a few hours or even days. Now I'm really scared. And although I told myself I was overreacting, I called the hospital. She wasn't there. I then called the police. But they said that I could not file a missing person's report until 48 hours had passed 
unless I was reporting a missing child. I thought about lying, but how could I tell them that I wanted to report a five-foot-three child with brown hair who could pass for a 38-year-old, even though she was 49? I thanked them and hung up. I finally tried to eat something, but I wasn't hungry, so I just put the food I bought in the refrigerator and sat in the darkened living room, hoping it would come back. She didn't return. I walked up the stairs a little after two in the morning and fell fast asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I stretched and found her side of the bed cold and empty. Everything washed over me again, and I lay there and thought, what should I do? I called work and said I wouldn't be there. My not showing up for work was so unusual that it seemed to cause concern. And before I knew it, my phone was ringing with colleagues wanting to know if I was okay, what I needed, if they could do anything. Something to do? And what should they do with those files? In truth, trying to help them a little was cathartic for me, and at least briefly took my mind off my worries. I called her office, but they told me she called and took the day off. I don't think they were hiding anything from me, although for some time I thought so, but over time I became more and more convinced that they were as ignorant as I was. I visited her office several times, hoping for a frank one-on-one -on -one conversation, but they didn't know anything more than what I already knew, which meant practically nothing. She left some time on Tuesday, but I didn't discover she was missing until late Tuesday night, and the police needed 48 hours, so I went to the police station on Friday morning to file a missing person's report. I showed them her note, and they asked if she'd done anything like this before. Yelling at the cops isn't a good idea, but by that point, I wasn't in the best mood. They threatened to charge me if I didn't calm down, so I forced myself to sit down until they decided I was a hot-tempered suspect, and they filled out the form. Afterwards, they said, Usually in such cases, the wife runs away with her boyfriend. You will probably find out if you are served with divorce papers in the next few days. Never in my life have I wanted to hit a police officer so badly. Instead, I just muttered, and thanks for that, and left. So much for the motto, protect and keep out. I returned home and collapsed into a chair. I was torn apart by stress. Having nothing better to do, I resumed calling friends and family, but this time I was smart enough not to call my children. Instead, they called me themselves, and I had to tell them that I still didn't know anything, but I was sure that everything was fine with my mother. She's smart, capable, and I'm sure she has everything under control. In other words, I lied to my children. A father should never lie to children, but I had nothing to tell them, good or bad, except that their mother was still missing. How to have this conversation with children who have every reason to worry about their mother. My calls to friends and family on Tuesday evening led to an avalanche of calls to me on Wednesday. They started out calmly, with comments like, just finding out, and by Thursday they became more and more worried. Everyone wanted to know what I was doing to find Marie, and by Friday the tone of some of them had taken on an unmistakable aggression. No one had spoken about it yet, but concern was giving way to accusations. If calls on Friday were bad, then visits on Saturday were simply impossible. I was inundated with visitors, friends and relatives stopping by to see how I was doing, and they always started with words of support, but soon followed by questions. Were there any problems between you? Didn't you quarrel? Was she unhappy? What got me was when her mother asked, Are you sure you don't know where she is? I lost my temper and yelled at my mother-in-law for the first time in the entire time we met. What nonsense are you talking about, Margaret? Are you accusing me of something? Do you really think I would lie about something like that? No, no, Jim, of course not. It's just... She paused. Spit it out, Margaret. Just what? She looked into my eyes, and with an angry look that I will remember until the day I die, she said, She's just never done anything like this before. I shoved my anger and pain deep down where I hoped it wouldn't show up, and in the calmest voice I could muster, I said, Do you think I don't know this? By then she was visibly shaking. Her husband said, Jim, we know you're doing your best. Could you tell us what you know and maybe we can work something out? I nodded, 
We sat in silence, and then I told them everything I knew, or rather, that I knew nothing. I showed them the note, and they were equal parts puzzled and concerned. The not-so-veiled accusations dropped, and we spent an hour bursting into tears, trying to come up with something, anything, that could explain Marie's sudden disappearance. But we had nothing. Henry and Margaret stayed until lunchtime while I prepared a light lunch for the three of us, or at least I thought it was three. Our friends seemed to have other ideas, and there was a constant stream of people at the front door, some carrying food, others beer, all wanting to know what had happened and what I knew. At some point, I stopped telling this story. At this moment, Margaret and Henry intervened. To their credit, I was absolved of the blame, and she gave me high marks for being a concerned husband. I know that everyone had their suspicions deep down, but at least there was a feeling that I had support again. I was absolutely shocked as Wellwisher after Wellwisher sat down with me to express their support and concern. I encouraged everyone to contact the police if they thought of anything that could help. But I secretly thought that someone knew something that they weren't telling me and hoped that the information would reach the authorities even if I'll never know about it. As far as I could tell, no one knew anything. And other than a few supporters calling the police to ask if they had any leads, nothing happened for several weeks. That is, nothing happened for exactly two weeks. The police had my wife's car license along with the make and model and put it on their watch list for possible car thefts. Whenever I made a comment to someone like, I hope they find her car so they can maybe find her, they looked at each other as if I didn't understand something. And I understood and knew what they were thinking about. She ran away. And there's a good chance she won't want to come home even if she's found. I tried to go to work, but I was useless there, and everyone told me to go home. Then I went home, and there I was just as useless. At first I sat and called. Then he drove around the area looking for her car. I even drove past her friends' houses, thinking that perhaps they were hiding her, although I could not imagine why. Day after day, I worried, called, drove, alarmed the police, but achieved nothing. In a fit of desperation, I contacted my lawyer to ask what I should do, and he connected me with a private investigator. Officially, the police said that this is my right. Unofficially, I could see that they didn't like it. I was told that private investigators usually interfere and interfere with the official investigation, so I asked them, what do you have at the moment? They didn't have anything, so I told them, in what could politely be called frank, that I didn't think a private investigator would stop them from finding anything. They didn't like it, but they also couldn't object. The private detective was expensive and returned with exactly the same thing that the police already had. Nothing. As I said, this happened two weeks after Marie disappeared. I still did the same things, calling, driving, and watching the news, but I also started checking Marie's social media, her credit card activity, and our bank accounts. There was nothing on the card, but two weeks later the money was withdrawn from an ATM in a city 200 miles away. I immediately called the police and informed them about this. This got their attention, and within half an hour two detectives were standing at my door, and the suspicions began again. Finally, I looked them in the eye and in the calmest voice I could muster, which in retrospect was only one small step away from rage, I said, No, I didn't go there and didn't use that car. All this time I was here in the city. Khaled Friends drove around looking for her car and did a hell of a lot more than any of you. Now you have a lead, so get off your fat asses and follow it. They clearly didn't like me very much, and just as clearly I didn't care but after half an hour of assurances and veiled accusations, they left. To their credit, they nevertheless contacted the police of that city and gave them information about the search for Marie and her car. Two days later, her car was found in the hospital parking lot. The local police called me and said, Don't do anything. Let us do everything. I answered, Hell no, and went. A little over three hours later, I pulled into this parking lot. It took about two minutes to find her car, but... It seemed like two hours. I also noticed two people in suits in a car just yelling cops. So I parked and walked up to them. I think they were waiting for me. I showed them my driver's license and said, show me your badges. 
They looked at each other and, being dissatisfied, still did as I asked. I got down on my knees and asked him to tell me what they knew, but all they knew was that they had the car and no one had approached it since they got there. When I said that I was going to go and ask about my wife, they said that they had already asked. I thanked them with all the fake sincerity I could muster and told them I was going to do it anyway. My tension was growing quickly, and I had no intention of making friends here. The hospital receptionist didn't know my wife's name and didn't know anything about the car park it on the street. So I decided to join in the surveillance. I had nothing to hide, and everything was profitable, so I asked it to sit in the back seat of their car. This may have been the first time I surprised a policeman since this all started, but they agreed, and I joined them. We talked for the next hour, and I briefly told them what little I knew. When their shift ended, and it was time for them to leave, they agreed to let me keep an eye on the car, but they made one thing clear. If someone comes for the car, it doesn't matter whether they leave the hospital or drive up to it. Do not interfere. Just call us and tell us the car is moving. Don't try to follow her. Don't do anything other than call us. Got it? I nodded. Remember, there is a small chance that they have your wife and they will lead us to her but there is also a greater chance that they just bought the car from someone and don't know anything. However, they can help us track down who sold them the car. It is very important that you do nothing. Is it clear? For the first time since this all started, I actually understood and agreed with everything. I returned to my car and sat there for the next three hours, slumped in the seat, watching Marie's car. The only time I left my post was for the fastest pee in history, when I walked in and out of the hospital so quickly that I was still zipping my fly while crossing the lobby. An hour later, I saw a woman approach the car, and my heart stopped. I tried to catch my breath. This is Marie. She opened the car door and took out something small, then closed it and headed back to the hospital. I followed her, keeping my distance. Something told me that if she found out that I was here, I would never get to the bottom of the truth. When we entered the hospital, I was about 20 meters behind her. I saw her enter the elevator and the elevator stop on the third floor. Very little time passed when I looked into the room and saw that she was sitting near the man's bed. He seemed to be asleep or unconscious, and she was holding his hand. I coughed, and when she turned and saw me standing in the doorway, my beloved and loving wife fainted. I was angry and confused, but I called a nurse who tended to her until she came to her senses. I spent most of this time studying the man in the bed. I had never seen him before. He was neither a friend nor a relative, just a man. But it is clear that for Marie he is more important than her marriage, more important than her family, and it seems more important than me. One mystery is solved, and then a new one appears. While the nurse helped Marie up from the floor, I took the opportunity to call the local detectives and report that my wife had been found. They told us to stay where we were and they would come right up and I told them the room number. Life was starting to get very interesting. And as I looked at the man in the bed, I felt a cold chill in my heart where there had previously been fear. Having come to her senses, Marie was almost hysterical and only shook her head when I calmly and coldly asked her questions. Why, Marie? Who is this man? Why did you run away like that? Why didn't you tell us where you are? Why didn't you tell me you were okay? Marie, what's going on for God's sake? Several times she looked as if she was going to answer, but then she lowered her head and began to sob again. I stood, waited, asked, and wondered when the detectives arrived. I let them take over and stepped aside but they immediately asked me to leave. One of them joined me and asked a dozen questions. I simply told him the truth, that I saw Marie approach the car, followed her, and then ran into her in the ward. Encountered might not have been a good choice of word, and I spent the next five minutes assuring him that I had not caused her any harm. When he learned that the nurse had found her lying on the floor, the questions resumed with greater seriousness. All this time his partner was talking to Marie. Over time, I think I convinced them that I didn't hurt my wife. Or maybe she convinced them. Don't know. 
They wanted me to leave, so I called the ward. Marie, if I leave here, I will divorce you. Do you understand me? This again caused hysterics, and she begged me not to leave. Then I looked the detective in the eye and said, I'm not going anywhere until I get answers. Eventually, I was allowed to return to the ward. As quietly and calmly as I could, I began to ask Marie the questions that were burning in my mind. Marie gave only mysterious half-answers. He is her high school boyfriend and was her first love. He's dying and he has no one. Between these lines there were long pages of information, but I could only ask or guess. How did you live here for two weeks without using your payment card? She was silent for a long time until she finally said, I lived at his house. So do you know where he lives? Certainly. And do you have a key? She nodded silently. How long have you had the key to his house? She silently shrugged and looked at the floor. I knew that as soon as I made the accusation, there would be hell to pay if I was proven wrong. However, two fucking weeks is more than a man should have to wait in the dark for answers. How long ago, Marie? She didn't answer. How long has the affair lasted? She did not answer the question or deny the accusation. At such moments, the mind becomes quiet. Later, there will be time for new questions and new pain. Okay, I think you should at least show me his house. I want you to take me to where you are staying. She looked at me in horror as panic overcame her. In the end, she gave in and nodded silently. She grabbed her coat and we headed to my car. I'll take you, I said, and then I'll bring you back. She seemed surprised but agreed. I think by then the detectives had decided it was a private matter. With a final warning not to do anything stupid, they left. Marie was silent almost the entire way, only giving me instructions when necessary. At some point she whispered barely audibly, I was told that we may be required to reimburse the police for their time spent. I wanted to ask, who is this we you talk about? But remained silent. Only God knows what my pulse and blood pressure were. I could barely stand. As we pulled into the short driveway in front of the townhouse, I realized that inside I would most likely find the answers to my questions. Marie led us into the house, and as I walked through the living room, I immediately noticed a pair of my wife's shoes on the floor by the sofa. Her favorite scarf lay on the chair. I wandered down the corridor when Marie called, James, please don't go there. If ever a wife's words backfired, this was it. I walked into the master bedroom. Marie's clothes were scattered on the unmade bed and chair and her cosmetics, etc., were on the dresser. Only when I opened the wardrobe and saw familiar dresses there did my last doubts leave me. There was a blue dress that was her favorite, but I knew for sure that it was hanging in her closet at home. This is a duplicate. And there were several pairs of shoes that seemed to be her size and style that she liked. She didn't pack this for the trip. These are the things she kept here. Now there was no doubt left in me, and I realized that if I opened a few drawers, I would find her underwear and the like. The room seemed furnished not so much for living as for an occasional overnight visit, dinner and dancing, and then intimacy and sleep in the arms of a lover. I returned to the living room, feeling defeated, where I found Marie sitting calmly on the edge of a chair, staring aimlessly at the floor. So, is there something you want to tell me? She just shook her head slowly. How long ago, Marie? Obviously this is not a platonic relationship. How long ago? She shrugged her shoulders silently as if she didn't know the answer, but obviously she did and didn't want to talk. Who is he to you? She was silent for a long time and then answered in a quiet voice, He was my first. We were together when we were in school. I wondered if she meant high school or college, but both were long enough ago that I decided it didn't matter. How long have you been dating him behind my back? It made her jerk her head sharply, but she couldn't deny it. She wanted to deny it, wanted it to be untrue, but we both knew it wasn't true. We met again about seven years ago. At first it was just lunches, then dinners. One evening, while you were out of town, we went to a dance. This was a year before we... before we... She paused. 
before you had sex? She nodded her head slowly. So you had sex with him behind my back for six years? How did you do it? Did you come here, or does he come to our house? This caused an immediate reaction from Marie. Her head jerked up. I never brought him to our home. I swear, I wouldn't do that to you. I nodded, feeling angry. So you can have sex with him, but you won't entertain him in our house. Glad to hear you're drawing the line somewhere. She was angry, but she couldn't deny anything. After a long silence, she said, I never stopped loving you. He never took anything from you, I swear. It was just a few nights a year, but I stayed with you forever. It was a lie straight out of a traitor's playbook, and I thought, what's the point of arguing? But there was a point. He took away at least some of the love you said you had for me. You saved a part of your heart for him. Because of him, you lied to me repeatedly. She made vows to me, but she gave him a part of herself that, according to you, was only for me. Don't say he never took anything from me. He took everything, even if you don't think so. Marie was crying, and I stood silently next to her. I knew everything I needed to know. I thought about destroying his house, breaking everything possible, but he would not return here. In the end, I just gave up. Let's go, Marie. I'll take you back to your lover's bedside. This brought another round of tears, but my heart was broken and I had nothing to console her. I drove her back to the hospital, and as she got out of the car, she begged me. James, please give me some time. He has no one. I can't let him die alone. I'll be back home soon. The last phrase caused a short sob. I'll be home soon, and we can get back to our life together. Please, I love you, I swear. I nodded silently and released her, saying that he was waiting for her. I think by that time she already realized that everything was over between us. I drove slowly home for four hours and don't remember any of it. I was devastated. Two weeks of stress and worry, all these friends and relatives telling me not to lose. Hope. And now I found out that all this time she was with her lover. I was exhausted both physically and emotionally. I only managed to stumble into the house and sit down in my favorite chair. I don't know how long it took before the first call rang. It was her parents, and they wanted to know where I had been, and if I had learned anything. And then I realized that I had traveled 200 miles without saying a word to anyone. I didn't think long about saving Marie the embarrassment, but apparently I had spent the last of my manly love for the woman who had betrayed me for many years. So I told Henry and Margaret everything. They didn't want to believe it until I described what I found in his house. At that moment, it didn't matter whether they believed me or not. My marriage was over. I knew it without having to think about it. This is a fact that burst from the depths of my soul, crushed my heart and consumed me. It's over between me and Marie. She loves another man, and I'm not one to share. Even worse, she spent years lying to me, going behind my back, and giving herself to him. This is not a mistake. This is a life of betrayal, and we cannot return to this. I called her friends to tell them the news, and didn't regret anything. He restrained his anger as best he could, but he didn't lie for her sake. After I used them for training, I called our children and tried to gently, but honestly, tell them that I had found their mother and that she was with her lover, dying in a hospital bed. They didn't want to believe it, so I told them about the townhouse. When they asked if I could forgive her, I replied, maybe someday, but I will never trust her again. I apologized to both of them, but told them I was divorcing their mother. Then, forgetting that they still had no way of contacting her, I asked not to tell her about it. He said that she needed all the remaining time to spend with him, and her rush home would not change anything. They argued with me, but in the end, they understood. Two weeks later, he died and Marie returned home, but I was no longer there. A week after returning, she was served with divorce papers. I didn't leave town, I didn't quit my job, I didn't hide from her. I just moved into apartments until I eventually found a place that suited me. I was close enough to the old house that the children could visit both of us. Marie tried to convince me, so I allowed her to do so. She came to my office or apartment and begged me to change my mind, but I had already decided. She cried and threatened, but it didn't change anything. This lasted six years. 
six years of betrayal, and if you count lunches, dinners, and dances, then seven. In the end, it was lies, at least as much as sex, that ruined our marriage. When I found out how well and how easily she lied to me, lied right to my face, with a smile, I realized that she did not look at me with the same devotion with which I looked at her. It's been two years since the divorce became final. I don't ask, but the children say that their mother just goes to work and then home. She's not going anywhere, or so they think. I'm sad that she's suffering so much, but I can't help her. To this day, I can't tell if she's grieving the loss of her first love or the marriage she betrayed. I'm not doing so well myself. I am not healed, but the pain is gradually decreasing. I don't date either, but I've started to notice other women and I suspect I'll eventually dip my toe into the dating pool. I am far from trusting another woman outside of a professional environment. I will never know why she betrayed me, what she was missing, what I couldn't give her, or how she justified her behavior. I guess I could ask, but what's the point? This is her decision, and she somehow came to terms with it at that moment. I never told anyone about this because I doubt they would believe me even now, but I never learned his name. There was a man on his deathbed and a townhouse where my wife played family when they were together. That's enough for me. You cannot take revenge on a dead person, and I realized that I could not forgive my wife who betrayed me. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.